Good morning. I'm Mark Albright, and I'll be your moderator for today's media availability. To start, Austin Public Health Director Stephanie Hayden will first say a few words, followed by Dr. Mark Escott, Interim Austin Travis County Health Authority, then by Pub uh, Austin Public Health Chief Epidemiologist Janet Pachette, and then Cassandra DeLeon, Interim APH Assistant Director, Disease Prevention Health Promotion Division. And then we'll be then we will open it up to the pool reporter who will ask questions from the media. Stephanie, over to you. Good morning. Austin, Travis County, we are at a state of community spread. It is going to be important for us as a community to band together again. We really must watch our behavior. The thing that is so important for us right now as we start to move along through this holiday season, we must be safe. We must continue to wash our hands, wear your mask, watch your distance, and stay home if you're feeling ill. Everything that you do should be essential trips only. I understand that this is our holiday season. I would warn you that is going to be important for you to only go out for essential trips. If you must do other things, please do them with the individuals that live in your household. That would be who you would go to a restaurant with. That would be the person that you would do your shopping with. We really encourage you not to connect with others that do not live in your household. It is very important for us. Our positivity rate is extremely high and we need to turn the curve and flatten this COVID positivity. I'll turn over to Dr. Escott at this time. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, you know, our, our, our situation is getting worse in Travis County. Uh, right now, we are the, at a place where we have more active infections in our community than any other point in time of this pandemic. And we've got to do more. We've seen the results of the Thanksgiving effect on COVID-19. Now we're in the phase of seeing infections spread by those who were infected during Thanksgiving and the potential for Christmas to accelerate the growth of, in number of cases and hospitalizations is, is serious. We have the real possibility of, of having a, a miserable Christmas and a miserable New Year uh, if we allow this kind of transmission to continue. It, it doesn't stop by magic. Uh, we can't will it away. We have to individually take responsibility and protect ourselves so that we can protect our community. The vaccine is here. We have the ability to prevent disease. We have the ability to prevent deaths through vaccination. Now's the time where we need to buckle down and not only push the positivity and, and the cases down, we need to push them down to zero because we have that capability on the horizon to vaccinate people across our community in the coming months. So let's band together. Let's, let's work hard to, to try to suppress disease here so that we can offer the opportunity for uh, for our folks to to stay COVID free in the new year. Good morning. Good morning. Um, you know, this week uh, we had a couple of firsts. We saw the entrance of the vaccine into our community and our healthcare workers beginning to receive uh, that first dose of vaccine. However, we've also seen a huge increase in the number of cases that we uh, have uh, as a result of uh, community-wide transmission that's currently occurring. Uh, I'm going to stress until you are able to get the vaccine or we 
get to the point where we have established herd immunity in our community, especially right now, it is absolutely imperative that you avoid non-essential uh, outings in your in your in your outside of your home. Uh, you need to if you need to go to the grocery store. I would limit that to sending one person out to that grocery store to get your groceries or having them delivered uh, at your doorstep uh, rather than sending an entire family out because anytime you are outside of your home right now, you must assume that the person you encounter is COVID positive and could potentially spread illness to you. So it's very, very cr critical if you want to ring in the new year and to have a safe holiday season that you heed these measures uh, and, and try to protect yourself. Again, we always say, remember the, the three C's, cover your face, avoid touching your face uh, and uh, wash your hands frequently. Uh, avoid confined spaces where people can gather um, and, and there's not fresh ventilation uh, coming uh, through that area. And then avoid crowds if possible because uh, they're ideal situations for disease transmission risks to occur. Good morning. And I just want to reiterate exactly what both Dr. Escott and Stephanie, our director has um, implored to please continue to practice your safe um, COVID protocols to protect yourself, protect your family, protect your friends, um, and the rest of our community. We're excited that we have the vaccine now and we're seeing it um, distributed to our um, direct frontline healthcare providers, um, our hospital staff, um, but it's a limited amount. We don't have enough vaccine to give our, our community sufficient coverage. We do expect in the coming weeks and months that that supply will increase. and We want for folks to get that vaccine as soon as it becomes available for them. Um, we at Austin Public Health are working with 266 providers across the healthcare system that are registered and enrolled as vaccine providers. And we anticipate that there will be opportunities through all of those other providers to access vaccine. Until then, and until we have sufficiently vaccinated and inoculated our community against this disease, we have to continue these infection control measures until this disease is no longer a threat. We've all had to curb our activities. We are delaying our activities to see friends and, and have those opportunities to be together um, during this time. But it's important to do that. We need to wait until it's safe so that we can have that long-term opportunity to continue to see folks within the, in the near future um, and for the years to come. With that, I'll turn it over to our um, for question. Thank you. Now to our pool reporter, Olivia Aldridge from Community Impact Newspaper. Thank you. Good morning. Um, the first question is for me at Community Impact. Dr. Escott has said that stage five restrictions could come with a curfew. What's the reasoning behind setting a curfew and how would it be executed in Travis County? Um, what time would it be set, for instance? So our concern uh, really is to is that we need to to limit the risk. Uh, what we're doing now is is not working. We're seeing disease spread worsen despite the the protections we have in place, which necessitates us thinking about how else we can limit risk. Right now, we're concerned about the risk associated with social gatherings in the evening. Uh, in particular, we're concerned about bars that are now operating as restaurants, but still functioning as bars uh, that are about, uh, able to do that through a, a loophole uh, in, in the current guidance. Uh, you know, as such, our, our goal would be to, uh, you know, look at starting a curfew around 10 or 1030 uh, so that if, if folks want to go to a restaurant with their family, people within their household, uh, they can do that before that period of time. I don't anticipate uh, you know, the consideration of a, of a widespread curfew uh, affecting uh, every business at, at this stage. Uh, certainly, you know, we have the possibility of getting that point if, if things uh, continue to worsen and we start to see an El Paso-like catastrophic surge. But for now, it will be a focused curfew 
uh, on those risk areas that I, I've just spoken about. This is from CBS Austin. Yesterday, we hit 613 new cases, about 200 to 300 higher than our previous highest days this month. Can you explain this sudden spike? So, uh, you know, this is the sixth highest day uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. And again, it's led to the highest number of active infections uh, in our community uh, since the beginning. Uh, I think what we're seeing right now is a result of that second generation of spread uh, after Thanksgiving. So at Thanksgiving, people were exposed when they were in gatherings. Uh, now those individuals have, have gone back to work or in their community or met with other people. And so we see increased spread uh, beyond that point. Uh, again, it's, it's critical that if folks have any symptoms at all, that they stay home. If they know they've been exposed, they need to stay home. That's how we capture and limit uh, the, the risk, and again, uh, this is this is about as worse of a situation as, as you can get in terms of leading up to Christmas and New Year's, where we know those social activities uh, traditionally happen again. We must alter our holiday celebrations, or we, we could face a, a real disaster here. I'll just add also, uh, just like Dr. Escott said, we are seeing transmission risks and it's widespread throughout the community. It's affecting businesses. It's affecting uh, kids who go to school and are participating in extracurricular activities. And then they're involved in a sleepover or having dinner with friends. It's involving um, our nursing homes. It, it, it's, as we said, it's widespread community transmission occurring. And we really, really need to be vigilant and careful when you go out in public, especially if you interact with people outside of your home. I can't stress enough that uh, it's going to be important that uh, you're careful because if you come home and bring it to somebody who's vulnerable in your household, uh, could, as, as Dr. Escott said, this could be very disastrous. Um, we're seeing situations where people who have mild infection are, uh, continuing to go to work or to school uh, because they don't think they're as infectious. That doesn't mean you're not infectious. We, we, you, you are still infectious, even if your symptoms are mild. So uh, that's the crazy thing about this disease. Sometimes it affects people very seriously and we see death occur. And then another family member may have mild, mild symptoms or no symptoms. Um, so we need to be sure that we're doing everything we can to limit disease transmission risks uh, in our community. Okay, KXAN asks if we can reach state if we reach stage five and have an El Paso level of cases, what will that look like on the ground? Hospitals overrun, opening the convention center? Uh, so an El Paso like catastrophic surge here would mean we run out of hospital beds, we run out of ICUs probably before we run out of high, uh, IC, uh, hospital beds, and and we have unprecedented numbers of deaths. Uh, when we look at, at El Paso's situation and the volume of surge they have, uh, you know we'd expect somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 1,500 additional deaths in the in the next couple of months. Uh, it, it's not a theoretical risk. We've seen it happen already in Texas. We've seen a, a, a huge surge in places like Lubbock, like Abilene, like Midland, Odessa, Waco. We're seeing it happen in Dallas and Fort Worth right now. San Antonio is, is surging as well. It's happening around the state. And we have to also remember that when so many areas are surging at one time, the, the backup resources are no longer there. They're occupied in the other places that are surging. Uh, so we must be very careful. And uh, again, I, I know we're talking about what could happen two or three or four weeks from now. And it's hard for people to appreciate the level of risk that, that we're talking about, but it's real. And we have the ability to change what that future looks like through our actions and our decisions.
from Austonia, which priority populations after frontline healthcare workers and nursing home residents will be next in line for the vaccine? Where do school employees fit in the order? So we are working with a, a large coalition from around our community, more than a, 140 individuals who represent community groups, uh, vaccine providers, hospital systems, to have those discussions. Uh, I can tell you that, that our decisions will be data-driven. Uh, the data certainly shows us that people who are older in our community are at by far the highest risk of death and severe illness, including the need for hospitalization. 81% of individuals who have died in Travis County are 60 years old or older. 95% of them are 50 years old or older. Uh, we also recognize that our communities of color have been disproportionately impacted throughout this pandemic. So those will be our priorities in terms of Austin Public Health. Uh, but we have to remember that, that Austin Public Health is one vaccine provider amongst more than 250 other providers. Uh, so we are working hard with that coalition to, to have a unified approach. Austin Public Health will provide vaccines to low income, underinsured individuals that may not have insurance. We will focus on communities of color because they are disproportionately represented in our system. Austin Public Health has always been a safety net um, provider to our community, and we will continue to be in that space. The thing that is really important for the public to understand is, is Austin Public Health provides vaccines. We are not a distributor of vaccines. And so when we think about that, our goal will be able to focus on those vulnerable populations and be the safety net for those individuals in Austin and Travis County. Oh, sorry. Go I would like to also incorporate that as the vaccine comes becomes available through um, pharmacies and other uh, primary care offices, um, as that vaccine becomes available, we the public will be asked to utilize their normal vaccine channels to access vaccine. And so we'll be working to make sure that folks are aware of when vaccine is available and how they can access it as we get more and more vaccine. Um, in our local community. The statesman asks, Austin Travis County's Hispanic population has been among the most vulnerable to the virus, showing to be the highest ethnic group in hospitalizations, cases, and deaths. How will APH provide equitable access to a vaccine, particularly for people of color who are bearing the disproportionate burden of the virus and have faced longstanding disparities in health? Over the years, Austin Public Health has worked with several uh, community-based organizations as well as advocates. Um, in those relationships, um, they have continued to provide information to us about um, priority populations that we should really focus our efforts on. We are going to continue with those relationships, continue receiving those recommendations, and those recommendations um, will be added to our plan. The overall plan that we have will be guidance that we are going to share publicly. Our hope is, is not just Austin Public Health as the safety net provider um, to determine some priority populations. Our hope is, is that other providers will determine trying to as well um, be able to provide these services. But our goal is, is to be the safety net provider for communities of color, receiving the feedback from our partners, um, and it will be put in the plan. Uh, KVU wants to know, AISD says it would close schools completely if they received medical advice directing them to close. Is Austin getting close to that point? Are school buildings still safe or are they becoming a hazard as cases rise? 
So the evidence that we have associated with, with school-related uh, COVID-19 transmission is that it's primarily happening in extracurricular activities, uh, both on the campus as well as uh, in private gyms that, that those uh, activities may utilize. Uh, we're seeing it happen in social gatherings outside of school. Uh, we're not seeing it in the classroom. Uh, we're not, you know, we've got lots and lots of individuals who have uh, been identified as close contacts uh, for those individuals who may have gone to school uh, while they were contagious, and, and we have not seen that translate into COVID-19 disease. Um, so schools, schools are safe, uh, but as community risk increases, as the positivity rate increases, the risk of transmission in schools will increase as well. Uh, I, I don't anticipate that we would uh, at this stage make a, a blanket recommendation to close schools, but uh, there are some key opportunities that we may need to take advantage of. Uh, similar to our recommendations after Thanksgiving, we may recommend to school districts if our cases continue to rise over the holidays, that they go virtual for the week to two weeks following uh, the Christmas break to help minimize that secondary transmission risk. Uh, if cases continue to worsen, then we may make uh, recommendations to eliminate extracurricular activities or severely uh, scale back those activities. Uh, we may make recommendations to, uh, if we get to this stage, to begin school closures uh, for in-person starting at high schools, followed by middle schools, and trying to pre preserve as much as we can uh, in-person elementary education. Uh, so these are all possibilities that, that we would need to consider if uh, if the surge continues to happen and we see uh, further threats to our healthcare system. And I'll just add that, um, again, a lot of the transmission risks we're seeing, as Dr. Escott mentioned, happen in an extracurricular setting and transmission chains going beyond the first generation to other areas in the community because people are involved in activities that may be associated with uh, that extracurricular activity. So if somebody's uh, participating in sports and they work out at a gym or they are in, they're a cheerleader and they work out at a dance group, we're seeing that type of transmission occur. Again, we've also, we've had seen a lot of transmission occurring because people continue to have uh, social events uh, that are also kind of tied to those extracurricular activities, like having dinner with those individuals or sl hosting sleepovers and other parties uh, in homes. We've heard of parents who have been bullied or threatened because uh, they uh, don't want to be the parent who has the child who has COVID, but they continue to send people or their, their, their child or student to class, which could uh, pose an added risk. So we need to be extremely vigilant. As far as I, as I said earlier, uh, if you have even the mildest of symptoms or if you know that you have been exposed, you need to make sure that you're isolating properly and quarantining uh, properly as well. So um, uh, those are gonna be very important in order to flatten the curve. This question is from Univision. Considering how badly COVID-19 is impacting the Hispanic community, why are we still allowing jaripeos, which are a rodeo type of concert, to take place in the city of Austin? Univision has had viewers sending them multiple flyers of events scheduled for the upcoming days. It is going to be important for individuals that know that these incidents um, parties, events are occurring in our community to reach out to 311. It is important for us to um, have these events on our radar so we can have staff that would be able to go in and to ensure that the individuals are holding the event as safe as possible. Um, we will be able to pull in, you know, our full team um, whether it's um, code compliance, um, Austin Fire Marshal, um, 
Austin, um, Austin Public Health Environmental Health Team. So it's really important for individuals to dial 311, provide that information to us so we can proactively be a part of what may be happening at that venue. Let me just, uh, to piggyback on that and say, large events should not be happening right now. Uh, but it's important to understand that there are some events which we as the city and county can legally cancel, and there are others that we cannot due to exception in the state's orders. Uh, our, our encouragement, our plea to our community is don't go. Please don't go to those events. Not right now, not when we have vaccine on the horizon, but not when we're trying to limit our risk. Uh, there'll be plenty of time to do that later on in 2021. Uh, if we can focus on decreasing the spread right now as much as we possibly can, and then getting as many people vaccinated as possible, the summer's looking good. Uh, summer looks a lot brighter uh, in, in the forecast and and it's, it really is going to take all of us working together to, to achieve those goals so that we can get back to normal. Now we're not normal and we really have to, uh, to dial back our risk and ensure that we can protect our community long enough to get vaccinated. Another question from Community Impact. Dr. Escott said yesterday that an El Paso-like surge in Austin would lead to the deaths of 1,500 Travis County residents over the next 60 days. Can you elaborate on where that figure comes from? Um, because of three times the current number of deaths, that's pretty stark. Yeah, so uh, when you look at the, uh, the surge in El Paso, El Paso had more than 5,000 active cases and currently still have around more than 5,000 active cases per 100,000. You know, we're around uh, 250 right now. Uh, so we're talking about orders of magnitude higher uh, case volumes than, than we've experienced uh, currently and have experienced throughout this pandemic. Uh, it is catastrophic surge. Uh, to a lesser extent, uh, we, we've seen uh, that happen in, in Lubbock with more than 2,000 active cases per 100,000 individual. Uh, that kind of surge is possible if, if it's not you know, uh, impacted through our actions. Uh, what I'm saying to our community is we can't let it go. This is what the beginning of that kind of surge looks like, what we're seeing now. Now that doesn't mean it's going to happen, but it will happen if we do not change what we are doing to protect ourselves and protect our community. From CBS Austin, do you expect the significant jump to 613 new cases to be sustained over the coming weeks? I think that's hard to say at this point. The, the data that we have in hand certainly suggests that that, that could be the case. Uh, we've seen positivity rise week over week. Uh, and you know until we start to see a dip in that positivity rate, uh, I, I don't think we have high hopes that we're gonna see any uh, significant downward uh, trajectory for our curves at this stage. You know, one of the things that we are really seeing is, is, you know, we have the Thanksgiving holiday, but typically once you move to Thanksgiving and you have the weekend after holiday, all of the holiday parties and celebrations get started and get in gear. And so everyone is really treating this year as a traditional year where we don't have COVID in our community. And we've got to change that. We cannot move forward and not realize how serious this community-wide transmission is. And so we've got to delay any of these gatherings that we are planning that we that we're going to participate in because if we don't we are going to arrive and those numbers are going to continue to increase and we could potentially 
be a city and a county with the trailers of individuals that we have to put in those trailers. I don't know if any of you have seen that, but that is very sad to know that your family member is in one of those trailers. And so I cannot emphasize the importance of us holding on and just establishing new trends and new traditions. It's going to be so important for your family, for your friends, for your loved ones, the ones that are in town and the ones that are abroad. We got to stay the course. It is so important for us all to do this. And I'll just add, you know, with most disease pandemics, we traditionally, and I said this in the past, see a second wave of cases. And we are seeing that right now for sure. I, I hope and pray that we do not get to the point where El Paso is and we're seeing 1,500, 3,000 3, cases a day. Um, if you can imagine that's 1,500 cases twice a twice of where we are right now. I just, I just can't fathom that. I, I, we've got staff working here around the clock trying to get this information and put it in and follow up on these individuals. And I think it's just the reason we try to stress um, the importance of, of trying to flatten the curve uh, by doing these uh, infection prevention measures. We, we must stay the course as both Dr. Escott and, and Director Hayden have said uh, in order to get control of this and to tamp down uh, this increase of cases. Uh, um, it, it's just all the more important, especially as we finish out the year and start the new year. I'd like to see us uh, start the new year on a, on a, on a good spot and be uh, at that, you know, seeing the trend come down, if, if at all possible. KXAN asks, how concerned are you about healthcare workers declining the vaccine? Are there early indications or numbers that show how many are declining to take it? Uh, in talking to our healthcare systems, they've really prioritized right now uh, individuals within the hospitals who are at the highest risk uh, for COVID-19 exposure. So our, you know, ICU staff, emergency department staff, uh, individuals working in the COVID unit, uh, and uh, we don't have uh, data back uh, regarding if if folks are are delaying that vaccination at this stage. Uh, in talking to my colleagues, you know, I'm an emergency medicine physician. Uh, everybody I know is is rolling up their sleeve and, and waiting for it to, to get here. Um, I'll tell you, I was offered the vaccine from one of the hospitals that I'm credentialed at. Uh, I asked them to, to give it to somebody else who's actually working on the front lines right now. I work more occasionally uh, directly with patients, so I'll, I'll wait until my, my EMS teams get it. Uh, but I, I personally don't know anybody in the healthcare field, none of my colleagues uh, who are, are going to wait. Uh, they wanted it as soon as they can. And I'd like to add from the providers that we've talked with that have received the vaccine for this week's distribution, they indicate that when that vaccine notification came in, they were able to fill all of the slots available for that vaccine. And so there is no concern at this time that those vaccine doses um, would not be used by the healthcare staff that have been identified. Um, in fact, they identified that there isn't even enough vaccine at this point to, to uh, meet the needs that they currently have. So we don't anticipate at this point that there would be um, a gap with the vaccine that we already have in our community. Okay, from the statesman. Does Austin and Travis County have a crisis standards of care policy providing guidance on how medical resources will be allocated if hospitals are faced with more patients than they can handle? In such a scenario, how would hospitals decide which patients get care and potentially which ones don't? We do have a crisis standards of care committee uh, that we had convened maybe six months ago 
uh, to start looking at the uh, the crisis centers of care and how we might apply those here. Uh, we we have been meeting. Uh, we have been having discussions, uh, and that involves uh, representatives from all of our healthcare systems. Uh, and uh, you know, again, our hope is that that we never have to use those, uh, but they will be centered around uh, what has was previously known as the North Texas guidelines. Uh, there has been some uh, some court decisions recently, which have necessitated modifications of those. Uh, but uh, should we get to that stage where we need to consider utilizing those, then then we will share those publicly, and uh, and and discuss further on on how that would happen. Uh, again, we have to be concerned as a community uh, about the possibility of having to ration critical care. And we, we still have the choice as a community to avoid that situation completely. But the choice has to be made now, not when we're already inundated and overflowing. Uh, this is the mistake that many communities make. They wait too long. They wait until the hospitals are already full before they start making changes to their behavior. That's too late. The disease is gonna continue to spread and increase for two or three more weeks before you see an impact. That's why the change has to happen now. KVU asks, how is making churches go virtual helping? People can go to the grocery store or any store, but you're recommending that they can't gather for services over the holidays. How is that any less safe than going to the store with hundreds of people we don't know? So remember, the disease uh, is transmitted by, by close contact, uh, and it's person-to-person -person contact. So the, the nature of religious celebrations uh, are such that individuals often sit in close proximity to one another for extended periods of time, both of which uh, make disease spread easier. There are other practices in religious settings, like singing, like holding hands, uh, like sharing of, of communal wine uh, vessels uh, that can also contribute to spread. Uh, I, I know it's difficult. I've been going to church virtually since the beginning of the pandemic, and it's not the same. It's not the same as celebrating with your faith community. Uh, but we have to realize that, that our situation right now is not the same as it was a year ago, and that gatherings of individuals, particularly in close proximity, for longer than 15 minutes, which is every church service, uh, that's a dangerous situation. In particular, those individuals who are at high risk, so over the age of 65, or significant underlying health conditions, or if somebody like that lives in your household, those individuals we strongly urge to stay home and do virtual worship this year. I agree. I agree with Dr. S. Scott. You know, I too have been attending church virtually. Um, and I am have always been a person that has attended church, Sunday school, you know, midweek service. And so this has been a, a transition for me as well. But I know that, you know, when you think about um, how churches, church services are, you do have the tendency to be around individuals for a longer period of time. When you go to the grocery store, that is a that's a brief encounter. You you will you will pass by someone in the aisle. Um, you know when you when you're checking out at the grocery store, you know the barriers are there. You're six feet distance, um, and so there there are, are more risk. And so our hope is, especially for those that are are 65 years or older and have underlying health conditions, it is going to be important for you to make those changes and, and modify. You know, it is, it is just a, a short period of time that we're asking everyone to come on board and do their part um, because we've got to, we've got to flatten this curve. And so that is our main goal is to really try to flatten the curve um, in any of the areas where people are gathering. And I want to mention one other thing, you know, our, our faith community in Austin and Travis County do an incredible job at serving this community. So it is important if, if you're, you know, worshiping virtually 
but you're also giving. Our, our, our churches uh, and religious uh, organizations around this community, our charities uh, who are non-church affiliated, now's the time of year for them to, to raise money to help people throughout the year. So it is critical that we give as much as we can to those organizations who are helping so many others this Christmas season. Um, what is our last question comes from Univision. Would there be a point that the city or the county has the ability to decide which group to vaccinate next, depending on how COVID-19 is affecting us? For example, teachers who are afraid to go back to the classrooms, would they be vaccinated sooner? Again, it's it's important that, that we're data-driven in our approach to, to vaccinations. Uh, there are so many uh, folks out there, including teachers, uh, who who are at risk for exposure. Uh, there are construction workers. There are food service handlers. There are police officers and, and uh, other public servants. Uh, but we have to understand that that the risk across those groups is not the same. We must prioritize the older individuals within those groups. We must prioritize those with underlying health conditions within those groups. Uh, they're at the highest risk for getting the disease and having a severe illness or death. And there's simply not enough to go around right now. And there won't be enough to go around for quite some time. So it's important that, that folks assess their risk and, and you know, in some circumstances make the decision to allow someone else who's at higher risk get that vaccine first. Uh, we are gonna have to come together as a community uh, and, and appreciate that, you know, a young, healthy, uh, you know, 20 year old teacher, 25 year old teacher has a much different risk profile than, you know, a 45 or a 50 year old teacher with diabetes and, and high blood pressure. Um, and it, it's going to take all of us to ensure that the folks who really need it the most uh, get it as soon as they can. But we will work hard to ensure that our communities of color, our, our low income, and that those essential workers that, that sometimes don't have the same access to uh, health care services, including vaccination, uh, have access through Austin Public Health as well as our partners like Community Care. And I'd like to add, as we're waiting for vaccine to become more available for the larger portions of our population, this is the time for um, our residents to uh, seek out knowledge about the vaccine, have conversations with your healthcare provider to find out um, when, uh, if your healthcare provider is a um, enrolled vaccinating uh, provider, um, and when they anticipate they might be uh, available to provide vaccine. Uh, there's a lot of different avenues for that information and a lot of different avenues for vaccine access. And so thinking about what would be your personal pathway to getting vaccine um, is really important and seek out those questions that you might have about the vaccine. We're working to provide those, those um, information points uh, available for the community um, just so that everyone is prepared so that when the vaccine does become available, there's no barrier and that there are um, all your questions are answered and you can have um, confidence in knowing that when you got the vaccine, um, you have that safety and, and you have been efficiently uh, provided that inoculation so that you um, can continue to help to do your part as far as uh, reducing the spread of this disease. And I'm, I will emphasize that Austin Public Health will be the safety net provider. You know, our goal is, is that we are going to ensure that communities of color um, individuals that are low income, as well as underinsured or don't have any insurance. Those are going to be the areas that we are definitely going to, to target. You know, we are going to use the, the data um, to make data, data driven decisions. But those are the individuals that we have continuously seen throughout this process, whether they have been um, hospitalized or that they may have died, um, those are the individuals that we must target. So Austin Public Health will continue to be the safety net provider for those individuals. I want to just mention one other thing, <clears throat> and that is that 
that we have a very large special event coming to town in less than a month. And that's our legislative session that's going to continue for six months. We're gonna have individuals coming from counties around the state of Texas with their staff, with the lobbyists, with many, many other people. Uh, and you know, our, our hope is that that the state is is considering how to protect that legislative process. Um, you know, I, 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 folks are going to be here at the time when when the vaccine is going to be available. But my hope is that uh, that if they need to be vaccinated, those individuals be vaccinated uh, in their home community, uh, and that we consider how we're going to to keep that legislative session safe. Um, you know, that our legislators have work to do on behalf of, of all of us, and we need that to continue. And, uh, you know, our hope is we can continue to work with the state on a plan that's going to keep that, that process safe and, uh, and continuous throughout the next six months. Thank you. Before we wrap up, would you like to give any closing remarks? Everything you do as an individual, anything that you decide to do um, outside of your home, you must do it with the individuals that live in your household. We are at a critical point. We encourage you to only have essential trips. Um, earlier, um, uh, Janet mentioned, send an individual out just one person from your home leaves. Um, if you have the ability to work from home, continue to work from home. Um, it's going to be important for us to, you know, continue your health hygiene uh, practices, wearing your mask, washing your hands, watching your distance, staying home if you're ill. If you have any symptoms, we hope that you would definitely reach out to your, your primary care provider um, and go ahead and take a test. Um, we must assume at this point, when you leave your home, and even if you have folks in your home that have made decisions that they're not just hanging out with you, you really need to consider everyone you come in contact has COVID pos is COVID positive. And so you need to take those precautions. And those precautions may have to continue in your household if you have individuals that are going to holiday um, gatherings, that are gathering with individuals that don't live with you. At this point, our goal is to keep everyone safe. We really hope that you establish those new holiday traditions. I know you are really probably tired of me talking about new holiday traditions, but I'm going to continue to emphasize that because it's going to be important. We have so many creative people in the world that have come up with such great um, ideas of how to safely um, be with other folks virtually. And so my hope is, is that you continue to do those things. It's going to be important for us because this is the way that we will flatten the curve. Again, we have unprecedented numbers of active COVID-19 cases in Travis County. And if we don't want to ring in the new year, in the middle of a catastrophic surge, now's the time to take action. Now's the time to change behavior so that we can protect this community and, and suppress disease so that folks can get the vaccine in the, in, later in the winter and in the spring. Now, we all have to band together to solve this problem. We can't do it alone at public health. We can't do it alone as city and county government. It takes all of the government, all of the community working together to flatten this curve again. And I'll just say, uh, while we do have unprecedented numbers occurring in the Austin area and we have widespread community transmission, there is light at the end of the tunnel. And that was with the arrival of the vaccine into our community uh, earlier this week. And so, um, until you can receive your vaccine, uh, it is going to be critical that you avoid those essential activities, 
um, you know, if you need to go get your groceries, send one person out, as, as Director Hayden said, um, uh, limit your exposure outside of your home at all costs. Uh, now, in order for us to celebrate the holiday season, we need to do it safely so we can protect those loved ones in our homes uh, and with throughout our community. Uh, again, uh, stay safe, Austin. And just to reiterate um, what all of our, our panelists have talked about today, this is the time to flatten the curve, really thinking about how we can do our part to protect each other, protect our spouse, our partner, our child, our, our parents, our grandparents, those of us that are uh, living with uh, multi-generational households, um, we really have to think about um, if we have individuals that are working outside the home that are in high risk situations, uh, making sure that we practice good infection control measures, um, even inside our homes and think about what that looks like so that everyone could be protected. Um, vaccine is exciting. It's nice to know that there is a solution on the horizon, but that's not the only solution. We are also part of it. We also can do our part to continue to practice these infection control measures and protect each other. Let's, let's look to, ahead to um, our holiday season in 2021. What could that look like? We can have the best parties ever if we can get this disease under control and really flatten this curve so that we don't have the threat of this to um, in the future. That concludes our media availability for today. Thank you to APH Director Stephanie Hayden, Dr. Mark Escott, Chief Epidemiologist Janet Pichette, Assistant Director Cassandra DeLeon, and toll reporter Olivia Aldridge for joining us today.